As a wildlife photographer, I've always thrived in the wild. I've spent years documenting nature's most elusive creatures, from snow leopards in the Himalayas to jaguars prowling the Amazon. I've ventured deep into forests where the sunlight barely pierces the canopy, camped on windswept mountainsides, and spent sleepless nights in bug-infested jungles. The unpredictability of wildlife is what kept me going, the chance to capture something rare, something no one had seen before. But nothing, not all the predators or dangerous situations I'd encountered, could have prepared me for the night I spent in the deep forests of the Pacific Northwest. It was mid-October, and I'd been hired by a nature documentary team to capture footage of the elusive wolves that roamed these forests. Wolves are notoriously shy, especially in regions like this, where human contact is minimal. So I packed my best night vision gear and set off into the remote wilderness, about 50 miles from the nearest town. My camp was little more than a small tent, surrounded by towering pine trees and a river that snaked its way through the valley. It was the perfect spot, isolated, quiet, and full of wildlife. The first few days were routine. I caught glimpses of deer, elk, and even a couple of black bears rummaging through the underbrush. At night, I could hear the distant howls of wolves. I'd sit in my tent, sipping on instant coffee, waiting for them to come closer, hoping to catch them in the moonlight. But they always stayed just out of range, haunting the edges of my senses. On the fourth night, the howling changed. It was subtle at first, an odd pitch to the sound that I couldn't quite place. Wolves have a certain cadence to their calls, a rhythm that feels natural. But this, this felt wrong. The howls were too low, too resonant, like something large was imitating them. My skin prickled, but I brushed it off. Spending too much time alone in the forest plays tricks on the mind. I assumed it was a distant echo bouncing off the mountains, distorting the sound. I climbed into my sleeping bag, my camera packed away beside me, and tried to drift off to sleep, but the howling didn't stop. It grew louder, closer. Every time I closed my eyes, I could hear it, threading through the trees, weaving itself into my dreams. By midnight, it had stopped altogether, leaving behind an eerie silence that hung in the air like fog. That silence was worse than the howling. It was as if the forest was holding its breath, waiting. In the early hours of the morning, something heavy moved outside my tent. I froze, every muscle in my body tensing as I listened. The footsteps were slow, deliberate. They weren't the light, cautious steps of a deer or even the lumbering gait of a bear. They were heavier, denser, and accompanied by a strange scraping sound, like claws dragging across the dirt. My mind raced through possibilities. An injured bear? A mountain lion? No. This was different. This thing had weight. I reached for my camera, careful not to make a sound. My heart was pounding in my chest as I flipped on the night vision, peering through the small gap in my tent. The moonlight filtered through the trees, casting faint shadows across the forest floor, but there was something else. A shape, a tall, massive silhouette stood at the edge of the clearing, partially hidden by the trees. It wasn't like anything I'd seen before. It stood upright, its broad shoulders hunched forward, towering over the bushes. I clicked the camera, the soft whir of the lens adjusting. The figure turned toward the sound, and my stomach dropped. Its eyes reflected the light from my camera, glowing faintly in the darkness. For a moment, I couldn't move. I couldn't breathe. The thing, whatever it was, stared at me, its gaze cutting through the shadows like a predator sizing up its prey. Then, in an instant, it vanished into the trees, moving with unnatural speed for something so large. I sat there, shaking, unable to process what I'd just seen. I wanted to believe it was a bear, maybe standing on its hind legs, but I knew better. No bear moved like that. No bear had eyes like that. Sleep was out of the question after that. I spent the rest of the night sitting upright in my tent, listening to every rustle of the wind, every crack of a branch. But nothing else came. By dawn, the forest felt normal again. The tension lifted, and birds sang their usual morning songs as if nothing had happened. But I knew something was out there, watching. The next day, I packed up camp and moved deeper into the forest. Part of me wanted to leave, to call the whole trip off, but my pride wouldn't let me. I'd come here for the wolves, and I wasn't leaving without at least some footage. I told myself I'd imagined the whole thing, that I was just tired, that the isolation was getting to me. But in the back of my mind, I couldn't shake the image of those glowing eyes. I spent the day hiking, 
setting up trail cameras in likely spots, following tracks through the mud. But something gnawed at me, the feeling that I wasn't alone. I tried to ignore it, focusing on the task at hand. But every so often, I'd catch a glimpse of movement in my peripheral vision. A shadow darting between the trees, a branch swaying just a little too long after I passed. By the time night fell, the unease had turned into full-blown paranoia. I found a new spot to set up camp, close to a stream where I could hear the constant flow of water, hoping it would drown out the silence that had become so oppressive the night before. I built a small fire, not for warmth, but for the comfort of its light. The howling started again as soon as the sun dipped below the horizon. This time, it was closer, more deliberate, like it was calling out to me. I sat by the fire, clutching my camera, staring into the dark woods. I didn't bother trying to sleep. I knew better now. It wasn't long before I heard the footsteps again. They were faster this time, more urgent. Whatever it was, it wasn't just curious. It was hunting. I stood, backing away from the fire, my camera still rolling. The night vision revealed little more than the outlines of trees, but then, in the distance, I saw it. The figure, taller than before, moving between the trunks with a fluidity that didn't make sense for something of its size. I zoomed in, my heart pounding in my chest, as the creature stepped into a patch of moonlight. This time, I saw it clearly. It was covered in thick, matted fur, its long arms almost reaching the ground. But what stood out the most was its face. It was almost human, but not quite. The brow was too pronounced, the jaw too wide, and its eyes, those glowing, predatory eyes, locked onto mine. I stumbled back, trying to keep the camera steady, but my hands were shaking. The creature tilted its head, almost as if it were studying me, deciding what to do next. And then it bared its teeth, sharp, yellowed, and too numerous. It let out a low growl that vibrated through the ground beneath my feet. That was when I ran. I didn't think, didn't plan. My instincts kicked in, and I sprinted into the forest, not caring about my gear or the camp. I could hear it behind me, crashing through the trees, gaining on me. No animal should have been that fast, not through the dense forest. But it was, it was right behind me, close enough that I could feel its breath on the back of my neck. I don't know how I made it, but somehow I reached a cluster of rocks, half tumbling down a small ravine. I scrambled between the stones, hoping they'd slow it down, hoping it couldn't follow me into the tight spaces. The crashing stopped. The forest went quiet again, save for my ragged breathing. I wedged myself into a crevice between two boulders, gripping a jagged rock as if it would somehow protect me. For what felt like hours, I sat there, trembling, listening. The creature didn't leave. It circled, slowly, just beyond my sight. I could hear its footsteps, deliberate patient, like it knew I had nowhere to go. Occasionally, it would let out a low rumble, almost like a chuckle, as if it were enjoying the game. I don't know when it stopped. Eventually, the exhaustion took over, and I must have passed out. When I woke, the sun was filtering through the trees, the morning light turning the forest into something deceptively peaceful. My body ached from the cold and the awkward position I'd been sleeping in, but I was alive. Slowly, I crawled out from between the rocks, scanning the forest for any sign of the creature. There was nothing, no broken branches, no tracks, no evidence that anything had been there at all. But I knew better. I didn't bother going back to the camp. I left everything behind. My tent, my gear, even my camera. I just needed to get out. The hike back to my car was the longest of my life. Every sound, every movement sent me into a panic. I kept expecting the creature to appear again to finish what it had started. But the forest remained calm, indifferent, as if the night before had been nothing but a bad dream. When I finally reached my car, I didn't look back. I drove straight to town, shaking the entire way. I wanted to tell someone, anyone, what had happened, but I knew no one would believe me. A bear attack, maybe, but what I saw, what stalked me through the trees, it wasn't an animal. It wasn't a hallucination, either. It was real. I've spent years in the wild, tracking the most dangerous creatures on earth. And I've always felt at home in their world. But now, something's changed. The forest no longer feels like a sanctuary. It feels like a trap. Like something is waiting for me, just beyond the edge of the trees. Watching, biding its time.
I still don't know what I encountered that night. Some would say it was a Sasquatch, a legend, a myth brought to life. But I'm not so sure. Whatever it was, it was ancient, powerful, and intelligent. And it wanted me gone. I haven't gone back into the wild since. Every time I close my eyes, I see those glowing eyes staring back at me, feel the weight of its presence in the shadows. I don't know if I'll ever be able to shake it. Some part of me wonders if it's still out there, waiting for me to return. But I won't. Not this time. Some things are better left unseen. Working as a park ranger, I've heard my fair share of campfire stories. You know the type? Old legends, urban myths, and the occasional wild rumor that the forest is home to something far more dangerous than bears or mountain lions. But these stories were nothing more than entertainment for me and my colleagues. We had real problems to deal with. Poachers, irresponsible campers, wildfires, and the occasional missing person. That was my world. And I was good at it. I had been working in national parks for over a decade. After a while, you develop an instinct for people and their habits. You can spot the day hikers who push too far beyond their limits, the campers who veer off the marked trails, and the adventurers who think they know better than decades of forest safety regulations. Missing persons cases, sadly, became part of the routine. I knew all the procedures by heart, organized the search parties, scour the trails, and most of the time, we'd find them scared but alive. And when we didn't, well, that was always hard, but nature can be unforgiving. Still, this latest string of disappearances, it didn't sit right with me. Something about it was different. The first hiker went missing about a month ago. His name was Dave, a local guy who frequented the park's more rugged trails. When he didn't return from his solo trip, his wife reported him missing. That wasn't unusual in itself. Solo hikers sometimes got turned around, lost their gear, or simply underestimated how long a trek would take. We launched a search, and after a couple of days of combing the area, we found nothing. No campfire remnants, no equipment, not even a footprint. It was as if Dave had just vanished into thin air. Then another disappearance followed. This time, it was a couple from out of state, experienced hikers who had mapped out a four-day trip. They went into the forest and didn't come back. Their car was still parked at the trailhead, untouched. We ran the same drill, search parties, helicopters, volunteers, but once again, not a trace. That's when rumors started to spread, quietly at first, among the locals. And when the third disappearance happened just a week later, a lone hiker named Maria, people started to talk about the restricted part of the forest. There were reasons why certain areas of the park were off limits. Sometimes, it was because of natural dangers, unstable ground, cliffs, or habitats of endangered species. Other times, the forest simply hadn't been thoroughly explored and mapped. This area, however, had an older, darker reputation. Some of the rangers jokingly called it Bigfoot Country. It was a dense, thickly wooded region far from the trails, and locals had long whispered that strange things lived in those woods. Creatures not recognized by science. I had dismissed those stories for years, never paying them much mind. But now, with three missing persons on our hands, the whispers grew louder. It was on a clear morning when I was called into the station to join the latest search party. My boss, Henry, handed me a map with a section marked off in red. We're heading out here today, he said. It's time we check the restricted zone. I raised an eyebrow. Are you sure about that? We've never had any issues with hikers going in there before. Yeah, well, we've also never had three people disappear without a trace in the span of a month. The higher-ups wanted checked, just in case. The team was small, myself, Henry, a few other rangers, and some volunteers. We were well-equipped and trained for this kind of thing, but there was an unspoken tension in the air. No one wanted to be the first to say it, but everyone knew what was on their minds. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, the forest legend. We set off early, the sun just peeking over the tree line, casting long shadows on the forest floor. The deeper we went, the more the landscape changed. The trees were older here, their trunks thick and gnarled, their branches heavy with moss. The underbrush was dense, and we had to use machetes to clear some of the paths. But that wasn't what bothered me. It was the silence. The forest, usually teeming with life, was dead quiet. 
No birds. No insects. Not even the rustling of small animals in the bushes. Just the heavy sound of our footsteps on the dirt and the occasional crack of a branch underfoot. It was as if we had stepped into another world. One where life had been drained from the land. After a few hours of hiking, we found the first sign. One of the volunteers, a young guy named Peter, called out from a few yards away. Hey, over here, you need to see this. We hurried over, and there, in a patch of soft earth, was a footprint. A huge footprint, bigger than any I'd ever seen, human or otherwise. It was easily twice the size of my boot, with five distinct toes pressed into the ground. But the thing that got me was the depth. Whatever made that print had to weigh a ton. I knelt down to examine it closer. Could be a hoax, one of the other rangers muttered. But I wasn't so sure. The print was too perfect, too real. Henry looked around, his face pale. Let's keep moving, he said. We still have a lot of ground to cover. We pressed on, and the deeper we ventured, the stranger things became. We found more footprints, some leading off into the trees, others circling back to the path we were on. And then we started finding animals, dead ones. The first was a deer, or what was left of it. Its body was torn open, entrails scattered across the forest floor. But this wasn't a kill from a predator like a bear or wolf. The carcass was shredded, almost as if something had ripped it apart with its bare hands. We found more as we continued. Rabbits, birds, even a raccoon. All torn to pieces, as if something had passed through the woods in a rage. Peter looked visibly shaken. What the hell could do this? He asked, his voice trembling. None of us had an answer. By mid-afternoon, the air had turned cooler, and the sense of dread that had been building all day settled into my bones. We hadn't found any signs of the missing hikers, not a single clue that they had been here. But the forest felt wrong, in a way that I can't fully describe. Like it was watching us, like it was aware of our presence. And then, as the sun began to dip toward the horizon, we heard it. A scream. It was distant at first, barely audible over the rustling of leaves in the wind, but unmistakable. It sounded human, but distorted, like someone was in pain or something worse. We froze, every muscle in my body tensing as I strained to hear it again. Did you hear that? Henry asked, his voice low. I nodded, my hand instinctively reaching for the radio at my belt. But before I could call it in, the scream came again, closer this time. It was coming from deeper in the restricted area, in a direction that hadn't been mapped. Against my better judgment, we followed it. The light was fading fast now, and we hadn't brought enough gear for a night search. But there was something compelling us forward, and in spoken agreement among the group that we had to find the source of that scream, or at least see what was out there. As we pushed through the dense trees, the scream came again, louder and more frantic. It didn't sound right. It was human, but off. Like someone was trying to imitate a person in distress but didn't know exactly how. We broke through the underbrush into a small clearing, and what we saw made my blood run cold. There, in the center of the clearing, was something standing in the dim light. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, covered in dark, matted fur. Its arms hung low, almost brushing the ground, and its face, God, its face. It was somewhere between a man and an animal, with deep-set eyes that glowed faintly in the twilight. And it was holding something. At first, I thought it was an animal, maybe another deer. But as my eyes adjusted to the light, I realized with horror that it was a person. A hiker, limp in the creature's grasp, one arm dangling uselessly. I recognized the bright orange jacket immediately. It was Maria. Before I could react, the creature turned its head toward us, its eyes locking onto mine. There was an intelligence there, a recognition that chilled me to the core. It knew we were watching. It knew we had seen it. For a moment, none of us moved. It was as if time had stopped. My mind raced, trying to process what I was seeing, but every logical thought crumbled in the face of that towering figure. This wasn't supposed to exist. This couldn't exist. And then, without warning, the creature dropped the body and let out a deep, guttural roar that shook the trees around us. It was a sound that reverberated through my chest, primal and full of rage. The ground seemed to vibrate beneath my feet, and the air itself felt heavy, as if the forest was responding to the creature's call. Run! Henry shouted, snapping us all out of our stupor. I didn't need to be told twice. We bolted back the way we came, 
crashing through the trees and underbrush, our boots thudding against the earth. The creature's roar echoed behind us, and for a terrifying moment, I thought I could hear its heavy footsteps pursuing us. But I didn't dare look back. We ran until my lungs burned and my legs felt like they were going to give out. Eventually, the sounds of the forest returned, birds chirping, leaves rustling in the breeze, as if whatever had been stalking us had retreated back into the shadows. We didn't stop until we reached the edge of the restricted zone, where the rest of the search party had been waiting for us. They took one look at our faces and knew something was terribly wrong. I tried to explain what we had seen, but the words wouldn't come out. How do you tell someone that you've just come face to face with a legend? With something that shouldn't exist? We reported what we had found. The footprints. The shredded animals. The eerie silence. But we left out the creature. Who would believe us? Even as rangers, with years of experience in the wilderness, the idea of something like Bigfoot roaming the woods seemed absurd. And yet, we knew what we had seen. The search for the missing hikers was officially called off a few days later. No bodies were ever recovered. The official explanation was that they had likely succumbed to the elements or encountered a wild animal. But deep down, we all knew that wasn't the truth. I haven't been back to that part of the forest since. None of us have. The restricted zone remains just that. Restricted. Occasionally, I'll hear a hiker or a local mention something about strange sounds in the woods or sightings of large, shadowy figures. I always brush it off with a laugh, telling them it's just the wind or an overactive imagination. But every now and then, when I'm alone at night, I'll think about that creature in the clearing, its eyes, its roar, the way it held Maria like a rag doll. And I'll wonder if it's still out there, watching, waiting. Whatever it was, it wasn't a myth, it was real. And it's still out there in the woods, somewhere deep in Bigfoot country. I've spent the better part of my life tracking animals across the untamed wilds of Alaska. It's the kind of place where the wind cuts like a knife, and the wilderness swallows you whole if you let it. From the time I was a kid, I knew the land out here better than most know their own backyard. Every crack in the ice, every track in the snow, I could read them like a map. After 30 years of hunting everything from moose to grizzly, I'd seen enough to know that there's a whole lot out there that most people never get to witness. But for all the stories I'd heard about strange things in the woods, I wasn't the type to believe in fairy tales. Bigfoot, Yeti, people like to talk, especially after a few beers. But I figured those were just stories made up to give folks something to wonder about when the nights got long and the cold set in. So, when I got a call from some wealthy client out of Seattle, offering me an obscene amount of money to track down what he swore was a Bigfoot, I almost laughed him off the phone. Tall tales, I thought. Just another fool with more money than sense. But the money was real, and after enough time spent chasing the mundane, I figured, why the hell not? A few weeks in the bush with a client, get him his pictures of some suspicious bear tracks, and I'd be back home before the snow really started falling. The man, a Mr. Harrison, insisted that he had evidence, videos, blurry pictures, and a few recordings that sounded like guttural howls in the distance. None of it convinced me but I played along. I was a hunter, not a skeptic. If the man wanted to pay me a small fortune to wander the woods and humor his fantasies, I wasn't about to argue. A job's a job. We set out on a cold September morning, just before the snow would really start to pile up. Harrison, all decked out in the latest gear, looked more like someone going on a high-end ski trip than an expedition into the Alaskan wilderness. I packed light, as I always did. My rifle, enough provisions for a week, and a good knife. The land out here doesn't care how much money you have or what gadgets you bring. If you don't respect it, you won't make it out. Our destination was deep in the Tongass National Forest, a stretch of land so remote that I doubted Harrison would last more than two days before begging to turn back. I was wrong about that, though. He was determined. I'll give him that. He had a strange obsession with the whole thing, like he was chasing more than just a story. It was personal for him, though he didn't say why at first. We spent the first few days hiking deeper and deeper into the forest, farther than even I had gone in years. The land out there is untouched, primal. We didn't see another soul, not even the usual signs of wildlife you'd expect. No moose tracks, no bears, not even the distant calls of birds. It was, still, too still. It didn't sit right with me, but I kept it to myself. Each night, 
as we set up camp. Harrison would go over his so-called evidence again and again, staring at those blurry images like they held the answers to the universe. I thought he was a fool, wasting his time on shadows. But then, things started to change. On the fourth night, we were camped by a small creek, the fire crackling softly in the stillness. That's when I heard it, a low, distant howl, unlike anything I'd ever heard before. It wasn't a wolf, and it wasn't a bear. It was deeper, almost human, but not quite. Harrison shot up, eyes wide, the excitement in his face unmistakable. You hear that? He whispered, as if speaking too loud would scare it off. I nodded, my hand instinctively moving to the rifle beside me. Probably just the wind, I muttered, but deep down, I wasn't so sure. We listened for a while longer, but the sound didn't come again. Harrison was buzzing with excitement, convinced that we were close. Me? I started feeling uneasy. I'd been out in the wild long enough to know when something wasn't right. And that sound, it wasn't natural. The next day, things got worse. We found tracks in the snow. At first, I thought they were bare prints, but they were off. Too large, too deep, and with an odd shape that didn't fit anything I'd seen before. Harrison was ecstatic, snapping pictures like a man possessed, but I felt a chill crawl down my spine that had nothing to do with the cold. We kept following the tracks, pushing farther into the forest. The deeper we went, the more the land itself seemed to change. The trees grew thicker, twisted, and gnarled, like they'd been warped by something unnatural. The air grew heavy, oppressive, and that eerie silence that had followed us since the beginning was broken only by the occasional crack of a branch or the distant, echoing howl. By the sixth day, I was ready to turn back. I tried to talk sense into Harrison, but he wouldn't hear it. He was obsessed, driven by some force I couldn't understand. I should have left him then, headed back on my own, but my pride wouldn't let me abandon a job. I was a hunter, after all, and I always finished what I started. That night, Something changed. We were camped on a ridge overlooking a valley when the howling started again, closer this time. It wasn't just one sound. It was many, like a chorus of guttural voices rising from the forest below. Harrison was beside himself with excitement, but I could feel the hair on the back of my neck standing on end. Whatever was out there, it wasn't something we were supposed to find. I told Harrison to put out the fire, to stay quiet, but he wasn't listening. He was too busy fumbling with his camera trying to capture the sounds. That's when I saw it, at the edge of the clearing, just beyond the light of our dying fire. Something moved. It was massive, easily eight feet tall, maybe more. It stood on two legs, its silhouette barely visible in the shadows, but its eyes, those I could see, they glowed faintly in the darkness, reflecting the firelight like a predator's. I grabbed my rifle, heart pounding in my chest, but before I could take aim, it was gone. Slipping back into the woods with a speed and silence that no creature but size should have. Harrison, I hissed, my voice low and urgent. We need to go, now. But he wasn't listening. He was already on his feet, heading toward the tree line, camera in hand. Wait, I barked, but he ignored me, stumbling into the darkness like a man possessed. I cursed under my breath and followed, my rifle at the ready. The forest was pitch black beyond the light of the fire and every instinct I had was screaming at me to turn back, to get the hell out of there. But I couldn't leave him. Not yet. We didn't make it far. We found the tracks again, fresh in the snow, leading deeper into the woods. But now, they weren't alone. There were more of them, crisscrossing in patterns that didn't make sense. I crouched down, running my hand over the impressions. They weren't just tracks. They were deliberate, like something, or someone, was leading us. That's when I realized we weren't tracking it. It was tracking us. Stop, I whispered, grabbing Harrison's arm. We're being hunted. He looked at me. Finally, really looked at me. And I saw the fear in his eyes. He knew it too. Whatever this thing was, it wasn't an animal. It was something worse. Something that was toying with us. We turned back, moving as quickly and quietly as we could through the trees. The howling had stopped, but that only made it worse. The silence pressed in around us, heavy and thick, and every snap of a branch or rustle of leaves sent my heart racing. Then, I heard it, footsteps, heavy, deliberate footsteps, pacing us from the shadows. I spun around, rifle raised, but I couldn't see a damn thing. Whatever it was, it was staying just out of sight, 
just beyond the edge of the light. Harrison was panicking now, his breath coming in quick, shallow gasps. What do we do? He whispered, his voice trembling. We keep moving, I said, though I wasn't sure if that was the right answer. Don't stop. Don't look back. But it didn't matter. The moment we started moving again, it came. A blur of motion in the darkness, faster than anything that size should be able to move. I fired a shot into the trees, but it was already gone, slipping through the shadows like a ghost. Harrison! Run! I shouted, but before we could take more than a few steps, it was on us. I barely saw it, just a massive, hulking shape crashing through the trees, its eyes glowing in the darkness. I raised my rifle, but it was too late. It hit me like a freight train, knocking me to the ground. The wind was knocked from my lungs, and my rifle went skidding across the snow. I struggled to get up, but the weight of the thing pressed down on me, its breath hot and foul against my face. I could feel its claws digging into my chest, but I couldn't see its face. Just those eyes, those terrible, glowing eyes. Then, as quickly as it had attacked, it was gone, vanishing into the trees like a shadow. I lay there, gasping for breath, my chest burning with pain. Harrison was gone. I scrambled to my feet, heart pounding in my ears. Harrison! I shouted, but there was no answer. I grabbed my rifle and staggered toward the last place I'd seen him. But all I found were his tracks in the snow, leading deeper into the woods. And the other tracks, the ones that didn't belong to us. I followed them, my mind racing. I didn't have a plan, just blind desperation. I wasn't going to leave him out there, not like that. The tracks led me to a clearing, and that's where I found him. Harrison was lying in the snow, his body twisted and broken, his face frozen in a mask of terror. But that wasn't the worst part. Standing over him, its massive frame silhouetted against the night sky, was the creature. It was bigger than I'd thought, easily nine feet tall, its body covered in thick, matted fur. Its arms were long, almost too long, and its hands. They weren't like any animal's hands I'd ever seen. They were too human. It turned to look at me, those glowing eyes locking onto mine, and for a moment, time seemed to stop. There was something in those eyes, something far too intelligent, far too aware. I raised my rifle, but my hands were shaking. I'd never felt fear like that before. It was primal, bone deep. The creature tilted its head, almost as if it were curious. And then, slowly, it backed away, disappearing into the forest without a sound. I stood there for what felt like hours, unable to move, unable to think. When I finally did, I ran. I don't remember much of the journey back, just the cold and the darkness and the overwhelming sense that I was being watched every step of the way. I made it back to civilization, but I never spoke of what happened out there. No one would believe me, and I wasn't sure I believed it myself. Harrison was reported missing, and his family was told he died in an accident, a fall, maybe, or an animal attack. They didn't ask for details, and I didn't offer any, but I know what I saw. Whatever's out there, it's not just a myth, it's real, and it's watching.